Good afternoon, everyone. I am Jeannie Gertz, and I work here as the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. But for this afternoon, I will be your MC for this special event in celebration of the life of our dear friend, Bernard Bragg. This is truly a celebration of life. We are not here to be sad, but here instead to celebrate this man, Bernard Bragg, his legacy and life, his many contributions, and the continuing legacy that he leaves us with. I want to talk briefly about Bernard Bragg before we proceed with our program. Bernard Bragg was truly a trailblazer. Do you all agree? He was a true burning light that opened many doors for all of us to navigate, especially in the world of performing arts. Bernard Bragg was an outstanding actor, acclaimed writer and playwright, director, an inspiring artist, not only a performer, but a poet and so much more. He also inspired many other poets and performers. And the list goes on. But with all of that, he left so much of a legacy. That we all aspire to. Bernard Bragg has already accomplished so much. And you'll see many of his accomplishments up here on the video monitors. Bernard Bragg was known in the deaf community, in the world of theater, the world of performing arts, and in so many other spaces. There is no better way for us to remember Bernard Bragg than it right here in this room at the Gallaudet Museum. The reason for that is because while Bernard Bragg was a student here at Gallaudet College, member of the class of 1952, he performed right on this very stage, in this very room. The room, of course, has changed, but this building used to be a theater. And if only the walls could talk, what would they say? And what could we learn about Bernard Bragg? And so we can see his influence was limitless. He was a light, bright and shining light, but never forgot his roots and where he first began. As our alumni in theater continue to thrive, they will always be recipients of his gifts and his legacy. I see so many faces out there that are, result, uh, that are results of the torch that he started to light. He also became a benefactor in so many different ways. Here at Gallaudet, five years ago, we celebrated our 150th anniversary of Gallaudet's founding. During that time, Bernard Bragg was honored as one of the visionary leaders, as you can see here. 
a banner reflected of that, reflective of that honor. He was also one of the few people selected into the Gallaudet Hall of Fame. Like I said, I could go on and on, but I think we all know and treasure what an icon he was, truly larger than life. So it is a great, great honor that we can gather together today to celebrate the life of Bernard Bragg and to remember him. There was a service hosted in his honor three weeks ago in Los Angeles, and President Cordano and I were fortunate and honored to be there. And we are now taking time to celebrate his life on the East Coast here at Gallaudet. We'd like to celebrate Bernard Bragg, who never stopped working and performing, even upon his retirement to California, which is where my relationship with him started to develop, back when I lived in California. He never took a back seat. He was always teaching, performing, and traveling the world. And we can see the results of his continued effort, that effort which will continue on into the future. With this, I'd like to give you the opportunity of watching a short, short collage representing the life of Bernard Bragg and who he continues to be before we continue with our program.
he definitely understood his place in the world. And he did that by leaving such a large impact and big shoes to fill. Now, those who are gathered today, friends and family, we would like to take the opportunity to share our thoughts and remarks about Bernard Bragg. There were so many people that we wanted to include, and we know that those who can't will be present with us in spirit. And with that, I would like to ask our university president, Roberto Cordano, Cordano to the stage to make some remarks. What a beautiful assembly. I'm inspired to see you here today to celebrate the life of Bernard Bragg on the East Coast, and thank you all for coming. It's so important that we remember by celebrating the life of Bernard Bragg. I'd like to recognize those that are here. Former President Davila, welcome. We also have our current Board of Trustees Chair, Seth Braven, Greg Leibach is also in attendance, as well as Marley Matlin. Harvard Corson, please stand. Thank you for coming to be part of this special day with us. I'd also like to recognize how many people have come up to me to say how much Bernard Bragg has encouraged them and wanting to share their stories with me. The fact that you are not here on this stage doesn't mean that your stories are not important. Remember, the, our community talks so much about connectivity, camaraderie, and commonality and to practice what we believe about the importance of our deaf community and how important it is to be connected with one another. And I think that that is proved by your stories and the fact that you are here today. So please st hold your stories until the reception and then share them with one another because we have so many rich stories in this room and we would love for you to share the beauty of your stories about Bernard Bragg with one another. It's funny that I'm standing here on this very stage. Back then, there was no drama major at Bernard Bragg's time at Gallaudet, but there were several student organizations that put on plays, several fraternities, I think, put on two to three plays a year. There was also a drama club at Gallaudet. Bernard Bragg graduated in 52, and my mother graduated in 1951. He is regarded here as a visionary leader at the 150th celebration of Gallaudet. Many of you, especially alumni, have shared stories about my mother and Bernard Bragg's friendly rivalry. They were constantly challenging one another. Students here at Gallaudet have a, a long history of forcing each other to be better than they could have been otherwise. And that's one of the things that we're celebrating today. My mother, unfortunately, couldn't be here. So she sent me a video long through text that I gave to him when he was here. And one of her complaints was that her name didn't show up in his autobiography. And she said, I need some credit for your fame because I picked a Moliere show that made you famous. The show is called Tartuffe. Tartuffe was here on this very stage. And at that time, the show was so well received that it went on the road. And Bernard Bragg's co-star was Gertie Galloway and they were together honored in the 150th celebration of Gallaudet. 
And Bernard Bragg said, you're right, I owe you my thanks. And my mother said, well, I'm still not in your book. But the two of them have some wonderful stories. The other story that my mother shared with me is that Bernard Bragg was an acclaimed author of The Buff and Blue. And he would always tell my mother, you're a chemistry major, you can't write anything. Buff and Blue was never going to publish your article. And my mom was inflamed by that and decided that she was going to get an article published. And sure enough, she was published in the Buff and Blue. And the next year, she was chosen as the queen of the Buff and Blue. But in a good spirit of challenging one another, those jokes became her inspiration. And people here at Gallaudet were here to make each other better. And in that same spirit, he did that with every person he met within the community. Many people were influenced by the fact that he encouraged them, offered them ideas and feedback. And he never changed. He was like this for the entirety of his life. And so this stage is important. Not only Truffaut, a Moliere play, but at that time, there was two or three Moliere plays that were performed on this very stage. And it's interesting that those plays were all French. The French connection with Bernard Bragg was very strong. His father often, ASL comes from French roots. And, I'm, and those phrase, plays are from French, France as well, and I'm not sure that we celebrate that enough. The deaf theater clubs here, in the United States, and Bernard Bragg was always writing about the deaf community. ASL has its roots in French Sign Language. And when Bernard Bragg came to Gallaudet, he was a star in a French play. He also saw Marcel Marceau and was then trained in Paris, France. And those connections with the history of our language are rich. And they've made me realize how Bernard Bragg was a man far ahead of his time. Here at Gallaudet, we just released a new bilingual framework. Because of our mission as a bilingual university. And we discovered within this process that we didn't have the rich language to describe some of the things that are happening in how we use our language. A good example is here, we have realized that when we send out a video message, at one point we pulled in a certified deaf interpreter to help me with my ASL. Because as I read the English text, I would have a different expression than when I was naturally signing. But this person was not functioning in the role of a deaf interpreter. They were actually functioning as a deaf editor to my ASL work. Now looking at Bernard Bragg's contribution to the world through his acting, I still don't believe that we have all of the right words and ideas to understand the impact that he gave to this field. In looking at his art, we still have so much more to describe what his impact is and will be. And that's one of our challenges in honoring his legacy. Not only those who come behind him, but those of us who can honor the art of the performance. The performing arts are provided through storytelling. And our language has, cannot survive in its beautiful and rich format without storytelling. But do we study that enough? Bernard Bragg knew how much work we had left to do, and he has given us his legacy to support a chair here in the performing arts to help us continually understand that this is an important center for theater, visual performance, and arts provided in our visual language, not only for the deaf community, but for the world.
and we are very grateful for Bernard Bragg's legacy to support our future here at Gallaudet. I want to close with a challenge. In the video you saw Bernard Bragg say, I finally understand my place in this world. Now Jacobs once said, what's so important to success is really what comes before. When he took his first calligraphy class and then decided he would drop into this calligraphy class. That class, at the time he took, changed the world. It's because when Steve Jobs decided to create the Macintosh computer, his calligraphy class went into designing fonts. He said, at the time I took calligraphy class, I didn't think I would have to develop fonts in the future. I just took it for fun and as a learning opportunity, out of curiosity. And so the message that Bernard Bragg is sending to us is that we should follow our passions, that we should pay attention to our community and what we have to offer our community in terms of our knowledge and wisdom every day. and to move forward without the promise of knowing what's to come. Steve Jobs didn't know what he would do in the future, but took many risks, and then was able to look back eventually and connect the dots as we can today. But he knew too that the future was in the hands of others, and we are now responsible of carrying on the legacy, the discovery, the power found within our community and ourselves. We have a rich community here at Gallaudet, and I invite you to take on Bernard Bragg's challenge today and moving forward. Thank you, President Cordano. It is now my honor and pleasure to introduce President Emeritus Robert Davila. And the shiny floor, I almost missed one of the steps. <laughs> These images we've seen here of Bernard tell you everything you need to know. It clearly tells us the story. Really, there's nothing more to say after that. But I have a lot to share with you, but I, I don't really have the time that would be needed to share it. But we did have a special relationship. When I was 15 years old, I met him. He was 20 at the time. He was a freshman when I came in as a new prep student. I got off of the train at the train station, made my way here, and he had all the freshmen standing in front of this very building, just outside on the steps. And they were all looking at all the prep students. And he pulled me out of the line and said, you're going to be my little brother here. And you know, I chose little sisters for the upperclassmen to guide through their matriculation here. And that became a tradition here. And sure enough, I ended up hitting the jackpot with him. You know, many of those relationships lasted a few weeks, some even less. Ours lasted some 71 years. We were always in touch with each other. 
he and I roomed together for a while. I got to know his parents. I knew his father. And then later, when I went to New York to teach at Fanwood, really, I got to see a lot more of his parents. His mother, even though I was just 25, 26 years old at the time, you know, I'm, I'm shaved twice a day, not twice a year. What did I say? Yeah. His mother used to introduce me as Bernard's little boy, <laughs> and the child of Bernard, or his son of sorts. And she's right in a way. Bernard was one of a kind. That describes him best. His legacy is that he did so many wonderful things and was one of a kind. In my heart, I believe he was absolutely one of a kind, and there will never be another of his like. He put his life behind his beliefs, and he worked so very hard. Became a teacher and ended up not knowing there was no theater for the deaf, created one. And I remember when he came to my school. He came and congratulated me and said, when you graduate next year and you're about to graduate Gallaudet, you go to Fanwood. And sure enough, I did. When Bernard was in San Francisco, and he became the first deaf person to get a show of his own, a television show of his own, which was no easy feat in those days. He had assistants and writers to you know, help keep the show going. And he was holding court, doing a show every day. He worked so very hard to keep it going. And he started studying others who didn't use their voices so much in the field of performing arts. And therein comes Marcel Morceau. And I asked him why he wanted to go see Marcel Morceau. He said, wait a second, I've got to go see that perform. He can perform for two hours without saying a word. <laughs> I believe it. So sure enough, we went. And we had a wonderful group of friends see him in New York. And he would come to New York every summer to perform and visit his parents. And we would all get together. We'd have parties and go to the beaches and do lots of things together. And we decided to give him a great send off to go off to Paris. And I think, don't we have a picture of that? Is the picture up now on the screen? Okay. This image. He was a good looking guy. And the lady just off to his side was his date. That was his date for the evening. And the date in that picture the date of that picture was June 7th, 1956. The very next day, June 8th, he flew to Paris. And we waited for him to come back, you know. We expected him to be back in August. And then my wife and I got him and drove to California. And we took our time. We stopped at places along the way. Inscription Rock. First, we went to Inscription Rock, where the first Spanish explorers, some 400 years before, had hammered their names into the, the stone there. And we thought we'd go climb their names and get rid of them, but nope, nope. It didn't work out that way. It was well protected, that thing. <laughs> We also ended up going to the Grand Canyon. When we got there, 
There were fire engines and police driving all over the place. There was a big to do, and you know, and it was the old days, so we didn't know what was going on at first. So we were peeking around, trying to figure out what the story was, what the problem was, and he, Bernard said, you know, I've got this. And he, we discovered it ended up being just a fire drill that was practiced that day. Then we ended up waking up in Arizona, and we found that two planes had actually crashed midair, even though he thought it was a fire drill. It was one of the biggest accidents in aviation history at the time. We had to find out what happened in the newspaper the following day. We've come a long way, but this man made such great company. And I went to California, my home state, a few times a year, and I would call ahead so that we could get together at his home and have a few cocktails, toss them back, and then go to a really nice restaurant and dine the evening away, eat and drink all through the night. He was such a great companion, but I never worked with him. I had a different career, but we were constantly exchanging information about our lives. On my drive to California, it was so wonderful hearing his life story, met three, four times along the way. <laughs> well, that was the first problem. He was extremely hygienic, always liked to be perfectly well kept, such an impressive man. He was a good smelling man, in fact. <laughs> but, you know, he would want to stop in a gas station, find a bathroom somewhere to attend to himself, and he'd walk in and say, no, no, there's no way I'm using this bathroom. We'd stop at three or four bathrooms along the route just to find one, 40 miles more down the road before he found one that was hygienic enough for him. <laughs> really, he was a fun guy and a very special person. There's probably some ways in which we, had, we need to bring him to the attention of young people. You know, he's someone who will affect their whole professional lives. We could teach courses about him in schools. We need to encourage more deaf people to be open to the arts and to open doors for others as Bernard opened the doors that had in turn been opened for him. Thank you. I will always miss him. Thank you, Dr. Davila. Your remarks made me smile, and I'm sure we all feel the same way. It is now time to introduce Dr. Harvey Corson from the National Theater for the Deaf, which was a big part of Bernard Bragg's professional life. Thank you. We are here today to celebrate the life of the world's acclaimed star, Bernard Bragg. Actor extraordinaire, who now belongs to history. We are assembled here in this chapel hall on this very stage where he performed his alma mater. He has left an enormous legacy for the performing arts and the deaf theater 
as well as the deaf community. Bernard Nathan Bragg was a man of many talents in his lifetime. He was a teacher and an actor. He was a storyteller, a poet, a playwright, a director, and an author. In 1967, Bernard Bragg helped to found the National Theater of the Deaf, working closely with David Hayes. Founder and artistic director for close to 10 years before moving on to other ventures. David Hayes shared his thoughts with us by saying, the significant work of NTD to advance this minority, deaf people, NTD would never have happened without the bold actions and skills of Bernard Bragg. Bernard Bragg must be remembered with love and admiration from all of us who care. To quote John Bassinger, a fellow NTD board member, 1968, who was on the uh, board of NTD at the same time I was. He was an actor and uh, a voice performer and a colleague of Bernard Bragg. He said, I often wondered what if Mozart would have been born deaf? Well, the answer to that question was Bernard Bragg. It is impossible to imagine the National Theater of the Deaf without the talent and contributions of Bernard Bragg. His stature, his skills, brought the birth, growth, and maturing of this national treasure that we all love so much. In 1977, after he left NTD, Bernard Bragg became an ambassador, engaging in a world tour, jointly sponsored, going through 36 cities and 25 countries, presenting the creative use of signs and theater and performing arts. Among his numerous awards and recognition, We had an 85th birthday reception where we recognized the NTD Lifetime Achievement Award that happened in the Rose Barn at the Eugene O'Neill Theater Center in Waterford, Connecticut. That was in 2013. We had a wonderful time together. What's important now is that through his art in TD, in his existence, created profound performances that educated as well 
where his extraordinary skills through performing arts was so masterful, so meaningful, that audiences left with memorable experiences that they forever will remember. That is the contribution to, of Bernard Bagg to this world. Thank you. It is with my great pleasure that I welcome an individual who needs no introduction, Marley Matlin. Today has come. Today we celebrate the life and legacy of Bernard Bragg. And thank you very much for hosting this today, which with a huge thank you to Gallaudet. I'd like to share a quote. Do not the most moving moments of our lives find us without words? That is a quote by Marcel Marceau, Bernard Bragg's mentor, teacher, and whom he revered. This, at this moving mo moment, I am feeling that I am truly at a loss for words. It's because Bernard Bragg is not physically here with us, but I'm sure that he would tell me, get on with it. And so I will. Bernard Bragg was someone who was very near and dear to my heart. Some of you may have heard his stories about when he visited a small community theater in Chicago called the National Center on Deafness. At the time, I was eight years old, and I boldly asked him, can I be an actor just like you? He was the first deaf actor I had ever met, and his response was, why not? That response stuck with me. Know that my words today are not about that Bernard Bragg, not about the storyteller who inspired thousands of children like me, or the actor, one of the founding members of the National Theater of the Deaf not about Bernard Bragg, the teacher. My remarks today are about the man and my friend. These stories go much deeper than that. He was someone I got to know well in the last five years of his life. We saw each other frequently, almost every day. I'd like, I like to tease him that he was my fifth child. And of course, I love all my ch children dearly and equally, and I love him as much as I love them. I have four children, and so I teased him that he was my fifth. And I said, you are the oldest yet last child, if that makes any sense. He was much loved. But I learned that my Friend Bernard Bragg was extremely loyal to the core. When he committed to something, he always kept his word. Even near the end of his life, when he wasn't able to see his friends, he always spoke about them and acknowledged them as deep as any friend would want. I learned that my friend Bernard Bragg had style, and he had class. He always wore a smart pair of pants, a button-down shirt, 
with an even smarter pair of suspenders. Just to go to a casual sushi dinner, Bernard Bragg's style was incomparable. He would even dress up for his VP calls. I learned that my fr friend Bernard Bragg had a steel trap memory and a thirst for current events. He was never behind in the national or world news of the day, and he valued CNN. He was an avid watcher and had an amazing memory where I couldn't even remember what I had for breakfast in the morning. And I thank goodness for that memory because I was so fortunate to watch him tell story after story in the thousands. Whether they were out about his dear mother, who he thought the world of, or his days with NTD, or his travels with various friends. What wonderful stories they were. I learned that my friend Bernard Bragg was dearly loved, loved by his community, and each and every person that he ever met, or taught, or mentored. Even the guy at the bakery. One time, I wanted to pr surprise Bernard Bragg with a donut and his favorite tea. And I thought I'd pick it up at the store and bring it to his home. But I wasn't sure what was his preferred flavor of tea. And so I entered the bakery and I said, do you know the deaf man who typically comes here? And without hesitation, the man said, yes, I know Bernard, and gave me the order. I brought that order to his home, and he was so thankful for it. And that was the Bernard I know. When I said, I love you, the night that he was, I knew that he was ready to pass, I looked at him and said, Bernard, I love you. And as our hands met, he said, I love you back. There were no tears on that day because I knew he wouldn't want it. But the next morning, a few hours after I found out that he truly had passed, I cried, as is natural. And I won't say goodbye, because he was with me and always will be. And I will always treasure that man, my friend, forever. Thank you. Thank you, Marley. I'd like to now introduce Alexis Kashar, who's the chair. chair, Board of Trustees, New York School of the Deaf, Fanwood. What a tough act to follow. I'll do my best. I am here on behalf of the New York School for the Deaf, Fanwood. We feel very honored to have been invited to sh share a few words about the Bernard Bragg that we knew. But to try and describe him in such few words is almost an impossible task, but I will do my best. The man, the boy that we knew at Fanwood. Here was our boy. Plain and simple, Fanwood raised, second generation Fanwood. He came to the school in 1933 at the age of four, graduated in 1947 at the age of 19. So we say his most crucial years, proudly, were spent at Fanwood. He was known for his kindness and compassion for people. 
I was told by a dear friend of his that he was always the one to welcome people when they would arrive, or maybe someone that he noticed that was more alone than they should have been. And at the same time, those qualities did not stop him from being the top student. He was motivated and determined to accomplish whatever that he felt was appropriate for him as a student. Fortunately, one of his earlier teachers was none other than Robert Panera, a teacher of English and the theater coach and whatever it was they called those teachers back in those days. But he taught Bernard Bragg not only English as his English teacher, but he encouraged Bernard's interests in the arts. It took a teacher to motivate him to get to where he ultimately landed. Bernard Bragg wrote scripts. He wrote scripts for a 1946 Christmas Carol play, Scrooge, as well as a list of others. But you can see the connections and the beginnings and his roots at Fanwood. He was also the captain of the military unit when Fanwood used to be a military school. He appreciated being in the military because he learned self-discipline, time management, which led to many structures of which he made decisions later in his life. He was also the editor of our literacy magazine and was well published. In the 1946 publication I read through, it was amazing work. Please come visit Fanwood someday in our museum and you'll see those in our archives. You'll find amazing works by him and others of his generation. He was also, not surprisingly, uh, graduated at the top of his class. He had many, he went on to achieve many accomplishments in the world that we see, you know, here today from the speakers and all of his commitments and honors that he's received at Gallaudet University. He came back for alumni events. He spoke to our students. He came back to Fanwood just because he wanted to be there. He did many extra things above and beyond that many alumni don't necessarily do today. He was always there for us, as we were for him. He was always very dear to us, and we decided as a board to name our auditorium after him. It's the first building on our campus named after a deaf person. I know after 190 some years, surprising to say that we do not have a building named after a deaf person, but now we do, and I am proud to say that it is Bernard Bragg. We were fortunate when he would come for events. People flew from out of town, from LA to New York City, came to be with him for that day, that special day that we named the building after him. And I think the photo, I believe, is of that very special day. Our students today ask, who's Bernard Bragg? New students get off the bus and come to our campus for the first time and they ask us, who is Bernard Bragg? And I am very grateful to tell them the story over and over and over again. Physically, he is no longer with us, but his light will always burn very bright at Fanwood. Thank you for having us here today.
Thank you, Alexis. Now it is with my great pleasure to introduce Michael A. Schwartz. who has had a relationship with Bernard Bragg that I will let him tell you. Oh, I was born deaf. And I didn't learn sign language until I was 22 years old. So from the age of two on, I realized the world was not accessible. Movies, television, theater, there were no captions. There was no accessibility whatsoever. I was so frustrated. Until one day at the age of nine, my mother took me to see the French mime, Marcel Marceau. And that was the first time in my life that I had accessibility to theater, to a performer who I, was, I had access to. I sat in the row with hearing people all around me and we were laughing at the same time, crying at the same time. I loved it. That was it. So whenever Marceau appeared in New York City, I'd buy tickets for a one week of shows. I sat in the front row and just soaked him up. He, when he was in Chicago, New York, Paris, London, anywhere. So when I went to college, and then as a senior in college, a friend said to me, hey, the National Theater of, of the Deaf is performing in Boston. That's where I went to school, in Boston. And at first I was like, eh, I don't know. Because I didn't know sign language, so I was resistant. I was afraid of deaf people. So I sat in the theater, and there was Bernard Bragg. And when I read the playbill, I was stunned to see that he had studied with Marceau. My God. I must meet him. So I wrote to Bernard. And I wrote on notebook paper, spiral bound. So you know when you tear off the paper, it has the little edges that actually made an impact on Bernard. So I wrote it, this four-page letter explaining who I was, that I was deaf, but I didn't really know sign language. And, I, and Bernard read it and handed it off to, at the NTD summer school director. And he said, well, I don't know. He doesn't know sign language. I don't know. It, he has to learn sign. So when they told me, I was like, all right, I'm going to learn sign language. That's it. I'm going to take sign class. And so I studied sign language. And when I applied again the following year to the National Theater of the Deaf Summer School, I arrived. And whoa, my god, they were all signing in ASL. And I had learned signing exact English. That was my first sign class. So I was like, I have no clue. Completely thrown. So then I saw in the corner of the room, at the, at the center of where the camp was in Waterford, Connecticut, there I was in the room, and there was Bernard Bragg. And all of a sudden, all the people that were gathered around him were out of focus. And there was Bernard, <laughs> in, in, clearly in focus, and I made my way to him. Like, I was saying hello to Bernard like a towering person. We were the same height, by the way. <laughs> and I just felt like, here's this giant. So I, it was as if I was signing up to him, looking up to him, and he's like, yes, little one. I just don't understand anyone here. How do I drop like the, the, the A's and the the's and the ing's and the, the English? And he said, just hang out with deaf people. That was Bernard Bragg. He was so welcoming and so loving and accepting. And from that moment on, I felt like I was a full member of the deaf community. <laughs> so in 
He had a tremendous reservoir of love. Filled with, the, with joie de vivre. That was Bernard Bragg. His favorite quote was, life is full of surprises. He was a master storyteller. He could render the ordinary extraordinary. And his favorite ending for every story he told was the credits rolling. He, he was an active, compassionate listener who made you feel special. He made you feel like you were the only person in the room with him, even if it was crowded. He would listen to you. And even towards the end of his life, when he wasn't feeling well, he continued to listen and to share. He was empathetic. He was always interested and had excitement for you. And Bernard's passing, the world feels a little dimmer without him. But the sorrow that we feel with his passing is leavened by the joy that we have of knowing him. What a legacy. What a man. Thank you, Michael. I love how he explained that Bernard Bragg was like a giant. That Bernard Bragg was truly larger than life. It is now my great pleasure to introduce DJ Kurz, representing Deaf West Theater in Los Angeles, California. I have a similar story. I entered Gallaudet as a freshman and took a class in deaf literacy. Yeah. Who was my Susie Ganacci was my teacher. I bought the books for that class. And she mentioned that Bernard Bragg was her friend. And I thought, are you truly friends with Bernard Bragg? I was mind blown. It was a different time and a different day. People like Bernard Bragg were few and far between. A hero of the stage someone who made it. How many of us came to Gallaudet and founded new professions or new fields and opened doors for so many? None like Bernard Bragg, who was truly a visionary. When I came to Gallaudet, I still didn't have a rich identity as a deaf person. I would spend my time at the deaf clubs and at deaf theater and continue to open doors because De Bernard Bragg was the first person to cross over those lines and build a deaf theater. He was a brave man, but he did not do it for himself. We've been friends for the last 20 years and Bernard Bragg used theater as an expression of love. His spirit was always to communicate with others. He used his body and his face as a tool that would help to share his heart with the world. And he used that, the stage as a medium. He was a man of incredible talent and language. He was even the one who came up with visual vernacular. When he came to Gallaudet, or when I came to Gallaudet, I have to thank people like Bernard Bragg for coming before me. 
who were truly able to use ASL and English as part of their daily lives. People often think that when you move to LA, it means you're starting to retire. But he still went out to bars and restaurants in Hollywood. There's an old school restaurant in Los Angeles that still has waiters who wear bow ties. And one time we went there. He wanted to meet, uh, I met his friend at a bar. His friend was named Ryan and he was Ryan Gosling, but he was just in a jeans and a baseball cap, of course, sporting the LA Dodgers. Another time we went to the same restaurant and it was time to go home, it was late. I saw a group of people, middle-aged men, with big black hats sitting in a booth. One gentleman got out of the booth and hugged Bernard Bragg. That was Johnny Depp. Bernard Bragg had a way of crossing barriers and boundaries, and I truly respect him for that. It was my honor and, it's my honor and pleasure to be here in a place where Bernard Bragg's identity and legacy launched him into the world. And so much of our work in California at the Deaf West Theater, nationwide and around the world, are because of Bernard Bragg. Many theaters in America and in Europe have been founded because of the work that he done. And I wanna honor his memory by continuing to act. His love and his desire to share his heart with the world and with people is what I am thrilled to share with you this evening. Thank you. Thank you, DJ. Now I will invite up Ethan Suno, who is responsible to oversee and coordinate the theater program here at Gallaudet. Ethan. That's absolutely the truth. He knew his place in the world in his last days. As a student of history, you know, that guides what I will say next to you. When I was a little boy, I remember my father giving me a book. When he handed me this book, I started poring over it, and I saw in there my first introduction to Bernard Bragg. It was the first time I'd ever seen him, but it was memorable, oh, so memorable. I never imagined in that moment that my life would lead me to running a theater program here at Gallaudet, at Gallaudet that is part of his lasting legacy. Ironic that it worked out that way. I didn't have a personal relationship with Bernard Bragg. Our relationship was more of one of my getting to know the man a little bit as a result of infrequent meetings across the, the time span that we've known each other from when I was a seven-year-old isolated little boy understanding who I was as a deaf person. I got to know him well in brief moments. I saw him perform a number of times and everyone here will have a story about Bernard. That's the kind of man he was. Now, mind you, we're in a place now that has an age-old tradition of having rites of passage and rites of theater. One of those is to know that human beings are complex creatures and imperfect at that. We are all cast in the roles we are cast in in this life. And he has lived that role with civility and courtesy and understanding and humility. And we aspire to be among the ranks of the gods, as he did. Now, I have an image I want to share with you today, which is an image from his last night here on Gallaudet's campus. That was in early September of 2015. It was the culmination of a week's events when he was inducted into our Hall of Fame. 
and his performance, our, he attended our performance of Julius Caesar and was able to meet with our cast and, in fact, share his words of wisdom with the cast. We have a picture of him with that cast on your screen now. I am so struck by the power of that moment. In that moment, in that room, with this assemblage of young people there to hear his remarks, we have the case of a man whose life on this earth was coming to an end. His health was deteriorating, and he was much aged. But his vigor was not lessened one whit. His eyes shone as brightly as ever as he shared his wisdom with those students. The, the light in his eyes kindled the light in theirs. That is something that I have to say I have seen go on through the passage of time. Those young people who have had the honor of being in that moment will later look back on the profundity of that moment shared with him that God has been among men and they were there to share it. You know, it's very interesting that his dad's name was Wolf. And if you think about it, many of our ancient cultures and civilizations, they have revered the wolf. That says something about Bernard Bragg's art of storytelling and the legacy that he's left. He's had so many roles in our lives. And think about how wolves appear time and again in cultures across the world. Many origin stories involve the creation occurring because of the work of the wolf. And the wolf appears as a motif time and time again. And the fact that his dad was named after this very iconic part of the origin, and he being the origin of our performing arts programs here is amazing. Here in American Deaf Theater, we honor him. This stage where we stand is the very stage where Gallaudet engaged in its own traditions of theater, which lit and stoked fires that would burn across generations. Much like the Greek Isle of Delos, where legend has it, Apollo, the Greek god of the arts, was born all at once from the foam of the sea and appeared fully made. Reminds me of Bernard Bragg, not just the actor or the originator of the hashtag Deaf Talent. He also came to us and brought full-fledged the force of his work to this very stage. That creates a sense of sacredness about this place. We have a culture and a people who look to him with pride. He is part of our own creation stories, an origin point that we look to that hearkens to the future that we would have because of the beginnings that he laid down for us. The whole country, in fact, stands with us looking at where all of this legacy began here on this very stage. His work with the National uh, Theater for the Deaf, his work with deaf talent across the nation began on this very stage. And this all takes place because of a meeting that he engineered to meet Marcel Marceau. That resulted in a long and flourishing professional career, but it also created new possibilities for deaf people to trod the boards of the stage. They can become masters of their forms of art because of him. That is all because of him. We owe him a debt that can never be repaid. Gallaudet is honoring his legacy and his contribution by continuing to hold dear and steadfast the legacy that he's given us, the traditions that we have of performing arts here will continue on throughout time because of his staunch support and will continue unabated. We will forever remember the birth of American Deaf Theater and its origins and his place among them and how that has led to a renaissance for us and our field.
Thank you, Ethan. Now I would like to take this opportunity to introduce a student who will provide a short performance and a monologue because of the legacy from Bernard Bragg and his love for theater. I will now introduce to you John Michael Taylor. But before he comes up, I want to share a brief remark. His grandfather is Vern Taylor, also an alumni of Gallaudet, who also performed on this very stage. In the performance of Oedipus Rex in 1957, Already, you can see the influence of Bernard Bragg. This is a beautiful connection between our past and our present. John Michael Taylor will perform a soliloquy from Hamlet. Entitled, Speak the Speech. Speak the speech. This is from Hamlet because Bernard Bragg was an avid lover of Shakespeare. He had a conversation with Ethan when he visited about all of the plays that he had been in, but that he looked back and wished that he had the opportunity to play in Hamlet, which he never did. And so not, without further ado, we would like to invite up John Michael Taylor. Speak the speech, I pray you, as I once pronounced it to you, triplingly on the tongue. But if you mouth it, as many of our players do, I had as lived the town crier spoke my lines. Nor do saw the air too much with your hand thus, but use all gently, for in the very torrent, tempest, and, as I may say, whirlwind of your passion, you must acquire and beget a temperance that may give it smoothness. Oh, it offends me to the soul to hear a robustuous, periwig-pated fellow tear a passion to tatters, to very rags, to split the cars of the groundlings, who, for the most part, are capable of nothing but inexplicable dumb shows and noise, I would have such a fellow whipped for or doing to magent. And out Herod's Herod, pray you, avoid it. Be not too tame, neither, but let your own discretion be your tutor. Suit the action to the word, the word to the action with this special observance, that you overstep not the modesty of nature. For anything so overdone is from the purpose of playing, whose end both at the first and now was and is to hold as twere the mirror up to nature. Thank you. And you see the Seeds planted by Bernard Bragg in this rich soil. Bernard Bragg never forgot his roots. He always cherished his beginnings here at Gallaudet. One of the most important things to him was a verse from Psalm 23. I'd now like to ask Kelby Brick to come share this verse with you. My mother used to perform here at Gallaudet University and also part of NTD and she would tell me about, she would say, my friend Bernard Bragg and my friend Bernard Bragg and every time Bernard would come to town, my mother would force him and force me to go see him at the theater, a theater that was sold out 
not an empty seat in the house, all there to see Bernard Bragg. I didn't appreciate him until I was 12 years old. My mother sent me to summer camp. I was with Bernard Bragg every day for 30 days. Honestly, let me tell you what, he was a task master with compassion, but he would say, what are you doing flopping your hands around like that? Stop it. Be proud. And the way you perform in sign language, he would say, do it again, and he'd say, do it again. As Marley has said, his memory was as sharp as a tack, and he would remember every detail of every story of everything my mother had ever told him and asked me about her when I, see, when I would see him. So this is his favorite scripture, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He guideth me and straight paths for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff comfort me. Thou preparest a table for me in the presence of my enemies. Thou has anointed my head with oil, and my cup runneth over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thank you, Kelby. With that, we come to a close. We are inspired by the man we knew, Bernard Bragg, who was truly a visionary leader. But we all know that as a leader, he did it because of his love for theater, for the deaf community, and the deaf world. But not only that, he created an amazing legacy that we can only aspire to. And that aspiration, Bernard Bragg makes possible. He has bequested money to Gallaudet in order to establish the Bernard Bragg Performing Arts Chair Fund. Those funds focus again on performing and contribution to expanding and creating new knowledge, art, and the preservation of deaf theater around the world. This legacy that Bernard Bragg has worked so hard to leave us will continue into the future. And all of us can be part of this legacy in perpetuity as well. I would now like to close by sincerely thanking you all for coming. We have guests from near and far to pay respects 
to this extraordinary man. You can see that theater was maybe his first and only love. I remember watching his play, Theater of the Sky. Now Bernard Bragg, the sky is yours. Continue to perform there. We salute you. And on your way out, you will see bookmarks on the table. And if you knew Bernard Bragg, you know that he loved to read. Not just perform, but his love of reading and watching the news would always be talked about. He would say to us, I found this wonderful new article or read this inspiring book. Information was so important to Bernard Bragg that you could find bookmarks in every book in his house. And now with this bookmark, you can make sure that he leaves his mark with you forever. And remember, his classic sign, take this and fly away into the blue yonder. Please enjoy the reception and share stories with one another. Good evening. <laughs>